When I started this channel, it was really to help improve my own writing. Deliberate practice was the idea. Uh, but then AI writing happened and I started to get interested in that. And unexpectedly, what happened was a number of people wanted to watch those videos. If you compare the videos I've done about writing sentences compared to how to write a novel with ChatGPT, you can see their views show that people are really interested in how to write a novel with ChatGPT and AI in general. So what's that about? Um, in this video I'm going to look at my attempt to write a short story, a short horror story using AI and then editing by myself. Um, I've given them all a, a chance, Sudorite, Verb AI, Claude, ChatGPT, Bard, I've given them all a chance at writing. Now if we unpack this, what I think is happening is that people, like with many, many things, want to get rich quick. So we all want the passive income where we earn uh, $500,000 a month by um, drinking cocktails in Bali and doing Instagram shots or doing a YouTube vlog about our wonderful life. And that may work for some people, but it doesn't work for most people. Or we want to have evergreen passive income books that we upload to KDP and we actually, the promise of AI, writing is that we can write a best-selling novel that's going to make millions with very little effort because that's the issue. We don't really want to do a lot of work to get those um, best-selling novels. I appreciate that some of the people out there uh, who listen to this, like myself, will have written many, many novels that have been rejected one billion times. And they may not be bad, they may be good, but the, the publishing industri industry isn't necessarily about quality, it's about saleability. And that's, you know, um, it's the same true for cheese, isn't it? You know, you may have the best cheese in the world, but um, if it isn't popular, then people aren't going to sell it. So the promise of AI writing was we get a lot of money without much work. Now, if you think about that, how can that be? If you think about what value is, value is time. So you either spend a lot of time doing something or somebody puts a lot of time into writing a novel or whatever, or making a video or whatever. They put their time, not only do they put their actual time, they put all their accumulated time in learning how to do that. So if you write a best-selling novel, you've spent a lot of time writing and reading hours and hours and hours and hours. You know, there's this, you know, Malcolm Gladwell, the issue about how many hours, 10,000 hours, and people have disputed how many hours it takes to get really good at something. But the, the essence is it takes you time, and that time is value. And people know, so when you go and you buy a, a very expensive item, it is, it is better made. It has better quality uh, materials that have taken, that are harder to get hold of. So they take more time to get hold of. It's got better quality workmanship. So the people who've made it have spent more time making it or had to learn an awful lot before they could make it in the first place. Okay, so that's what we value and that's what we pay for that time and the accumulated time of learned expertise. Okay, so if if we can write a best-selling novel with ChatGPT very quickly, the value of that goes to close to zero. So the value of writing goes to close to zero, and we see this now on podcasts. Let's look at podcasts. People produce hours and hours and hours of lovingly curated or produced material, and they don't get paid for it and they have to work out different ways to get paid for it. Or with um, self-publishing books, Amazon KDP, people write their novel, it may, may have taken them a year to write, and it goes on to KDP, and there are eight million other novels, you know, to compete with. So the fact is that if anybody is able to use ChatGPT to produce a best-selling novel, the value of that, and it doesn't take a tremendous amount of time to learn or a tremendous amount of time to create, the value of that work goes to close to zero. So there will be no best-selling novels produced with AI. In fact, the danger is that nearly all novels will go to be worthless. So that's problem number one, that if Ch ChatGPT or another AI can write a fantastically crafted novel in for you, prompted by you in short time, the value of that novel will be close to zero. So the second problem is that when I looked at the story that um, ChatGPT and some Claude had written, I wasn't happy with it at all, and I spent so long 
rewriting it that it it was like nothing like the first version well i mean the 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 the, the plot was the same but the prose was completely different i had to rewrite nearly every sentence and so it makes me wonder and i have come to the conclusion that I am saving no time at all by doing the first draft through AI I, because it takes me so long to correct the um, the prose that's produced by AI to my own taste to, to anything that's worth writing and putting your name to that um, it wasn't worth it. So that is my conclusion. It writes so badly, really. It writes, it doesn't badly, it's mediocre. It's just something you wouldn't write if you had any aspirations to craft or technique or writing a story. And I think the reason for that is, of course, obvious. ChatGPT and the other large language models are trained on masses of data. And most people can't write good prose. Uh, and so it is going to produce... At the best of it, it produces horribly purple prose. It's just we've talked in the previous videos about its problems of overstating, its problems of making everything very uh, Pollyanna. You know, everything is wonderful. Uh, there are no, there's no tension. It does away with tension. It has no idea. I may be wrong, but I do not see a profitable future using AI for fiction writing. That was my conclusion. So let's look at the process that led to me concluding that. Originally, I'd started off to leaving the whole of story development to the AI to see how far we could get with it, whether we could write a reasonable story completely based on AI. I had um, a, an idea for a short horror story. And, you know, where do stories come from? From a, a mix of places. So I'd done a long distance walk in England this summer in June, I walked the Ridgeway down in the south of England uh, for a couple of weeks. And uh, so, you know, it's, we did 120 miles, so we took it quite easy. I was with my partner. And I say long distance walkers now because we live on the Hadrian's Wall path, which is another long distance wall. So I see them on a daily basis when I'm out walking the dogs. I remember a holiday in about 2006, long time ago now, uh, staying in the Black Forest in Germany. And I also remember an advert called the Judderman for Metz um, uh, which uh, was a, uh, I never drank it, I don't think, but it was like this horrible dancing, prancing marionette figure. And it was related to the Struvelpeter, which is a a, a German, uh, came from a, a book in the 1800s, which was to t teach naughty children. I think Edward Scissorhands was based on that sort of shock haired person. So I thought, can we combine this idea of walking a long distance trail through the Black Forest? It's called the Vestvek that goes through the Black Forest from Fort Simon in the north right down into Switzerland to Basel. And some of it's pretty remote, so I thought, right, that's what we're going to do. It's a very simple short story, very simple, nothing striking about it, but I've got the idea for it. So let's see if we can work it up with AI. So I started off doing um, images. This was, this is the German hiker, Markus um, Schneider, I think. And uh, this is the strikingly handsome not but he doesn't look anything like me carl weston 29 year old english adventurer so these uh these descriptions were developed by chat gpt actually so i've been using chat gpt and claude as you'll see so what the pictures and this is the this was an abandoned house it's too abandoned this is struvel peter I went for one of these abandoned houses. I went for that one, I think, in the end. This is the abandoned house. So I'm already getting... And I wanted the Struvel Peter himself. So evil shockhead monster, mentally ill, sinister, killer, portrait shot, 50 mil, mil lens, dirty face. And we came up with that. He looks like the people who live in my town, to be fair. Yeah, he's okay. He's okay. He's okay. Did variation of this. And we go down uh, trying to do variants of him. Uh, I quite like that one. Um and we played around with what Struvel Peter looks like. Um, he's not completely right. He looks like somebody out of The Prodigy. And I was kind of, well, we'll stick or The Purge. He's far too handsome and hipster looking. Uh, he was too old. So anyway, uh, this is what's brewing. And uh, yeah, so did I get to... I put the Judderman picture in. You see him there. There's the Judderman. And it came up with some kind of uh, white walker from Game of Thrones. So, and that I think it, that's what it must be based on or trained on. And I came up with uh, one of these in the end. I think I picked on not him, but him for Struvel Peter. Anyway, I do like these images, but um, and there's Johnny Depp. 
uh, looking, you know, devilishly handsome, etc., and evil. They're, they're quite nice, but he's not wicked enough to be Struvel Peter. There we are. So, okay. I then went over to Plotter, the app, to structure the story. There's only six scenes. I do not want this to be a long story. I'd like it to be 3,000 words. If it ends up as six, it will. But I don't want to stretch the wordage. I like that word, wordage. So um, I went into ChatGPT and I asked it to set out the outline of this story. I wanted to have a little bit of depth and resonance, so I used Mark Fisher's ideas of the weird and the eerie. These ideas, there's the weird, there's the eerie and the uncanny. The uncanny is really Freud, but uh, um, Fisher talks about all of these. I got it to set me out the beats, so the introduction, Carl Anderson, an adventurous hiker with a mysterious past. The first scene is really approaching the house. He's, he's walking this trail. It's absolutely raining like it is now here he's he's climbed up to the Hochmoor um, which is part of the uh, remote part an eerie part of the Black of the Vestavec Trail at this point I don't necessarily want to introduce Struvel Peter I just want him to have uh, so he's gone too far here I don't want him to meet that German hiker I want it just to be the build of the seeing the house realizing he's got 15 kilometers to go he's going to get soaked he's going to have to take shelter for the night in this abandoned house on the Hochmo. i don't think there is one but there we are leave it at that next thing he's in the haunted house and he's in there and he hears somebody downstairs this so that we get the scare and then it turns out to be a perfectly innocent german hiker doing the same as him this guy marcus schneider they decide to tell scary stories one of my favourite scary stories is the Kroglin Vampire. So what we have is um, uh, Carl Weston telling an English story of the Kroglin Vampire with a key feature. The Kroglin Vampire is killed with a silver dagger. Okay, that's important for the story later on. It's a bit of foreshadowing. Then what we have is Marcus tells a story of the Struvel Peter, the, who is a demonic creature in the Black Forest that haunts the Black Forest. Uh, and then I went and got, first of all, uh, these are the characters. So there's Carl Western with the picture. This description was created by ChatGPT. Marcus Schneider, the German hiker, 39 is a bit older. And then the, the Struvel Peter thing. Uh, there's only three characters in it. And you see the outline, the timeline, one, two, three, four. And I've put some of it in. So this is the ChatGPT model. I've got the I've got the first scene. That's all I want. You remember in the past we'd had trouble with ChatGPT going on too far. So I thought, listen, I'm going to feed it scene by scene. I'm not going to give it any more. And I'm and I've got a bit of the scene already. I know from my own uh, what's in my own head, and I know from actually working it through ChatGPT to get the outline what I want to see. So I give it quite a long piece of instruction. Write me the story of a man called Carl Weston who embarks on a long-distance hiking trail in Germany called the Westweg, which runs from Pforzheim in the north to Basel in the south. Please only write a scene where Carl has been walking for some days on the trail, staying in hostels and small hotels. It is now mid-afternoon, but there is heavy rain, and he has just climbed 120 metres from Hensbeck to Hochmoor. The Hochmoor is bleak in any case, and the terrible weather with poor visibility makes it very inhospitable. He feels the Hochmoor is eerie and begins to be frightened, though he knows it's irrational. Then, through the low cloud and rain, he sees an abandoned house. The weather is getting worse and he has 15 kilometres to walk before he reaches the hotel he'd hoped to stay in. That journey would be too much. Telling himself his fears are irrational, he decides to camp down un until the weather improves in the shelter of the abandoned house. Carl Weston trudged through the relentless rain, his boots sinking into the muddy ground with each step. The Westweg had tested his resilience over the past few days, but nothing compared to the desolate stretch of the Hochmoor that lay before him. The heavy fog shrouded the landscape, making it impossible to see more than a few meters ahead. The eerie silence only amplified his sense of unease. As Carl climbed the 120-meter ascent from Henspeck to the Hochmoor, his mind was filled with trepidation. The unforgiving weather and poor visibility seemed to transform the moorland into a hauntingly inhospitable place. He knew his fears were irrational, but the nagging feeling of discomfort persisted, sending shivers down his spine. Just when Carl's spirit was at its lowest, a faint silhouette emerged through the low clouds and rain. An abandoned house, seemingly untouched by time, materialized before him. 
It stood alone, a solitary sentinel against the elements. The sight of shelter amidst the bleakness offered a glimmer of hope. As the rain intensified, Carl's resolve wavered. He glanced at his map, calculating the remaining distance to the hotel he had planned to reach. It was a staggering fifteen kilometers away, and with the worsening weather, the journey seemed insurmountable. Rationalizing his decision, he convinced himself that waiting out the storm in the abandoned house was the sensible choice. Carl approached the dilapidated structure, its windows cracked and covered in grime. The creaking door protested as he pushed it open, revealing a musty interior. It was a refuge from the elements, a temporary respite from the harsh reality outside. The abandoned house offered little in the way of comfort. A single room with peeling wallpaper and rotting furniture greeted him. Ignoring the eerie atmosphere, Carl focused on making the space habitable. He cleared a corner of the room, pushing aside debris and setting up his sleeping bag on the relatively dry floor. He unpacked his meager rations, consuming a cold meal as he listened to the relentless rain pounding against the windows. Hours passed, and darkness descended upon the Hockmoor. Carl lay on his sleeping bag, the sounds of the storm lulling him into a fitful sleep. Dreams mingled with reality, and his imagination conjured whispers carried by the wind, sending shivers down his spine. Startled awake, Carl's heart raced as he tried to discern the source of the disturbance. Outside, the storm had reached its crescendo. Rain battered against the windows, and thunder rumbled in the distance. The abandoned house groaned under the strain, its time-worn structure creaking as if protesting its lonely existence. Determined to dispel his irrational fears, Carl mustered the courage to peer out of the window. The scene that greeted him was one of chaos and desolation. The rain fell in torrents, obscuring his view of the surrounding landscape. The storm seemed relentless, and the realization hit him that he had made the right decision to seek refuge in the abandoned house. With a deep sigh, Carl resigned himself to wait out the night. The storm would pass, and the morning would bring a new day. He closed his eyes, seeking solace in the knowledge that his fears were indeed irrational. The abandoned house became his sanctuary, a beacon of safety amidst the unforgiving wilderness. As Carl drifted off to sleep once more, his mind filled with thoughts of the journey ahead. He would face the challenges of the Westweg with renewed determination, fortified by the courage he found within himself during that eerie night on the Hockmoor. I then asked her to write the next scene. Write me how Carl awakes to hear a noise downstairs. It's still raining, it's not very late, but it's dark because of the heavy clouds. It's only about 9pm. He listens, tries to convince himself there is no one there, but the sound comes again. He becomes anxious. Then he hears the unmistakable sound of someone climbing the stairs. Show, not tell. No interior thoughts. Be cinematic. Write the scene. So ChatGPT writes me probably 150, 200 words. I decided to do the same thing, but with Claude. So this is Claude.ai. It's currently free. I wanted it to be of a similar style to the ChatGPT. So what I did was I fed the, the scene that ChatGPT had written, the first scene, which I was happy with, into Claude. And uh, I say, this is the first scene. Please do not output anything yet, but use this style when writing more scenes. So then I did the very same thing and just uh, copied the same the same instruction. Write me how Carl awakes to hear the noise downstairs. Exactly the same. It's 9 p.m. He listens. Be cinematic. Show not tell. No interior thoughts. Now, Claude writes much, much less. Uh, so I think in, in that case, I have to go with ChatGPT. But... What I'm going to do is, my next task is, because it's not good enough, either. neither is good enough. We talked about that. You've got to put your own work into it. So, And the purpose of this video is showing how I edit those scenes to be something that I would be happy to write. So what I did first was I took what ChatGPT had written and I put it into google uh, docs and then i started commenting on it as if i was commenting on somebody else's piece of work and i found that actually when i edit there's no necessary i mean i'm guessing I, I have absorbed the rules over time but i kind of do it by ear i i i make it sound better so there's two processes one is i make the sentences sound better and the second is i'm looking to 
do the character development. I'm looking to foreshadow. I'm looking to use sensory description to put the reader there. So I'm doing all of those things. And also I'm, I'm removing redundancies where things are mentioned twice, where we don't have to. We don't have to spoon feed the reader. So that's basically what I was doing. And I started off on Google Docs, as you can see, and then I, it was just, I was just changing too much. I was just absolutely changing pretty much everything. I tried to record the process of me editing in the hope that it would be, you know, insightful into how I do it anyway. But um, I, I thought that's maybe a bit tedious. So here's what I ended up with. And if, if you can compare it with the first version to see which you like best. Carl Weston trudged through the relentless rain, his boots sinking into the muddy ground with each step. And every time he walked on, the ground pulled at his feet as if it wanted to keep them. Over the last week, he'd walked over a hundred miles of the Westweg long-distance trail from Fortsheim through the Black Forest, and he now stood contemplating the desolate Hochkopf rising before him. The daily walking, the damp, the dreary weather had all worn him down and conspired together to make this the most challenging part of the journey. Carl looked at the heavy fog that shrouded the landscape, making it impossible to see more than a few metres ahead, though it wasn't fog so much as settled cloud as if the distinction made any practical difference. And so he began Carl the 120-metre ascent from Henspeck to the Hotkopf. He was a fit man. His body was tired from the days of damp hiking, but his mind was unaccountably ill at ease. His feet were wet, but that was his own fault. He had considered getting some seal skins, but he thought they were too expensive. Now his heels and soles were blistering and sore. But this unease that gripped him was more than that. It wasn't just physical, it was spiritual. And Carl Weston was not a man much given to spiritual matters. He reached the plateau of grass and reeds. The unforgiving weather, loneliness and poor visibility transformed the moorland into a hauntingly inhospitable place. He hadn't seen anyone all day since he left his small hotel that morning. No one else was daft enough to be out and about in this weather, but something about the lack of people and animals had spooked him. He knew his fears were irrational and that the eerie emptiness of life was simply due to all sensible people and animals seeking shelter somewhere drier, but the nagging feeling of discomfort persisted, sending shivers down his spine. He trudged on. This walk was bloody endless. What he wouldn't give now for a cup of tea and a piece of Victoria sponge or even a bit of Black Forest Gatto. Then, when his spirit was at its lowest, a faint silhouette emerged through the low clouds and rain. He peered forward as best he could and, with each step, an abandoned house materialised before him. It was obvious it was abandoned from its state of disrepair. The roof still held, but the windows were broken and trees were growing from the chimney. Even so, this was the first house he'd seen in a long time. As grim as it looked, it represented shelter from the bleakness all around. He had miles to do. He really should push on, but his feet were wet and sore and he was so weary of this rain. Rain ran into his eyes from his soaked eyebrows. He sighed. Something about the relentless rain sapped his normally buoyant spirit. He stopped and took out the high-quality German map made of plastic that would not come apart in the soaking rain. The hotel he planned to reach that day was a staggering nine miles away. He looked the house up and down. There was nobody around for miles. What harm could it do to seek shelter for a while, hoping the rain would ease so he could continue on his way? Carl approached the dilapidated structure and stopped. The door was just in front of him. Someone had forced their way in at one time, and it stood an inch open now. The house windows on the ground floor were cracked and covered in grime. He went up to the broken pane and shouted, Hello, hello, but no one answered. The rain hammered down on his hood. Carl shrugged. He walked over to the door and shoved it with his boot. The creaking door protested as he pushed it open, revealing a musty interior. He had the weirdest feeling telling him not to enter. He was wary but went in anyway. Just because you're scared doesn't mean you shouldn't do something. He'd cleared houses in Sangin, and this place was unlikely to harbour any insurgents. So he entered the porch. The place was a wreck, but enough of it still stood to keep out the rain. The abandoned house offered little in the way of comfort. There were four downstairs rooms, all damp, all full of wind-blown weeds and branches, wallpaper peeling and mould tracking up the walls. He didn't look in all of them. What would the point be? They were all the same. There was also what appeared to be a cellar. Carl peered down the rotten wooden steps but didn't venture down there. Lord alone knew what he'd find. Rats. The bones of dead tramps. So that was my version of 
the uh, Westweg Struvel Peter story. I hope you think that it was better than the um, ChatGPT version. I do, and I suppose in the end, it's what we are happy with putting out, whether we feel that the um, writing represents our voice and what is the thing that we want to say, rather than what an AI wants to say. Because the AI in the end is just going to do an approximation. It's going to do a statistical story about what most people would say. But actually what we are contributing as writers, whether we are appreciated and loved for it or not, is our own voice. And AI can't do that. Uh, and after this period of testing different kinds, I've come to that conclusion. And so I think for now, that's me finished with AI. I'll continue to write, but it'll be me writing, not ChatGPT or Bard or Claude. If you enjoyed that video, watch some more.